Hello, welcome to this short introduction to desk research. My name is Stephanie Decker. I'm Professor of History and Strategy at the University of Bristol. So today we'll be focusing on desk research as one of the options for you to conduct research for your dissertation. Uh, desk research is also sometimes known as library research. Um, that is because traditionally, obviously, a lot of the information you might compile uh, may be coming from a library. And in, in some ways, that is still the case. So desk research is a really good option for you to consider when you are preparing your dissertation. Uh, some people are saying, really, it's, it's currently very COVID friendly because obviously you don't have to do any field work or meet any people face to face. But desk research has always been quite a good option uh, for conducting research, either supplementary to another approach or on its own as a very good way of, of addressing some key questions in business and management studies. Now, to understand what desk research means, we need to look at types of data collection. So there are broadly three types. Uh, first of all, uh, we could consider just speaking to people as, as one of the types of data collection. OK, so that might be interviews, focus groups or surveys and surveys obviously sometimes are done remotely, but they're sort of a replacement for speaking to people and eliciting answers from them. The second type is observation and observation, again, broadly falls into two different types, uh, participant observation and non-participant observation. So imagine you are in a, in a business setting and you may be there and allowed to observe a meeting, but you are not participating in the meeting. That's obviously non-participant. However, you may also be working in this organization and part of your time is earmarked for research. So you'll be doing the job while also researching what is part of doing the job in this organizational setting that would be participant. Finally, and this is really the most important category because this is broadly what's understood to be desk research. There are um, documents, statistics or multimedia you may be collecting. So documents obviously is mostly meant to be textual information. Statistics um, might come from data collection or uh, databases that other organizations have collected. This is very often the case for economists, uh, for people who look at finance. So you will be downloading statistically collected information that you haven't yourself collected. Uh, but that comes from a reputable agency. And then these, de uh, these days, thanks to YouTube, um, that there's quite a lot of opportunity to do much the same with multimedia resources. Now, these types of data are known as secondary data, whereas the previous two types of data, they are primary data. Now, they are primary because you raised that data yourself, you created the data. Whereas secondary data is different. Secondary data is something that you have found. And this found element is really quite important. So you might uh, try and find data somewhere like a database, uh, the library, and of course, increasingly the World Wide Web, because these are all repositories of a lot of data. As I said, for quantitative approaches, it's very common, but it also happens for qualitative, more text focused approaches. And there is quite a lot of data in the public sphere or in databases that are paid for and that the university will hold so you can access it through the university um, subscription. Some of these that are relevant for you if you're interested in qualitative desk research, which is what we're mostly considering here. So we're looking at text and to some extent, say video and audio. But if we go back to in particular text and documents, the key resources are Business Source Complete, Mintel, and Gartner. But there are a number of others, so it's worthwhile to look a little bit more broadly. The library has information on that. But, and this is a really important but, the one thing that your secondary textual data is not is academic articles, right? So um, don't annoy your supervisor. There's a big difference between what you write in your literature review, which is the academic writing about a subject. This is the conversation you are joining, that you are contributing to, that you are framing your dissertation with. And this is different from data. OK, so if you're interested in how to do a literature review, um, have a look at this link. I, I did a sway um, a couple a couple of months ago uh, and this way it sets out how to prepare a literature review. What we're talking about here is data. So textual data is not the same as academic articles. 
what we mean when we are looking for textual data is we are looking for data about firms, organizations, companies, entrepreneurs, um, perhaps economic policy, um, NGOs. So organizations and data, well, either from them, so we could say data from firms to just narrow down on one type, would be perhaps annual reports or looking at their websites. But it could also be data about firms. So it could be in the newspapers and magazines and very importantly, industry reports. Um, and these you will be able to find in the databases um, I, I listed earlier. Uh, these are not the only databases. They're just an example of what's out there. So check what the library holds at any one point in time and the librarian can always help you with this. So where does this leave you? Well, you might have a lot of questions now that you've started collecting this data and you're looking at it and thinking, so what do I do with all this data now? It's it's found data. As we said, it doesn't follow a shape that you designed as part of, say, a series of interviews. So when you have questions, you should ask questions. And with this kind of data, it is extremely important you ask questions of the textual data of the documents that you have collected. So some of the questions you should be asking here are, who wrote this? Why did they write this? What does this data say? And what does it not tell me? Okay, so you should be investigating the kind of text you're collecting. You're not just passively collecting. You should ask yourself questions about timing. When was this written? What was happening at the time? Is this sort of influencing what you're reading in this text? Also, what does the author know? Why was some of this material being made available, either publicly through a database? How does it come to, to be accessible to you? How reliable is this information? Is it confirmed or contradicted by other data you've also collected? So not all documents might necessarily tell you one story. They might tell you different stories and you need to triangulate between those stories. You take different types of data and you compare and contrast them. So you might also ask yourself questions such as, are there any interests at stake? Are there any obvious biases evident in this data? So these are key questions that you need to answer when you're working with texts. Now, essentially what you're doing is you're judging the text. You're making an evaluation of their um, viability. Is it something that is that is useful, that looks reliable? Uh, is it something that shows biases? Most types of text have specific intentions and you need to understand the intention in order to interpret the text correctly. So these are all issues that revolve around credibility and validity of the text you're looking at. This is part of what you should be reflecting on for your methods. And I've given you two references here. The first one is Assessing Documentary Sources, is the chapter in uh, John Scott's book, A Matter of Record, that introduces ways of working with documentary sources. And secondly, uh, Malcolm Tide's document and documentary research. He's sort of introducing um, this approach to you. This is available through the SAGE Research Methods Collection. OK, so we've looked at credibility and validity. Um, you may have been assessing your documents, evaluating them, and you might find yourself going round and round in circles. So you are not really finding the material you need to answer the question you set out. You might nevertheless be finding really, really interesting material. You might be searching again. You might be finding other really interesting material, but again, not quite answering the, the question you set out in the beginning. So what happens if you search and you can't find? At that point, you really need to start thinking creatively and wondering about what can you do with the material that you actually have here? Because if you have found really interesting things and it doesn't fit your question, well, you might want to reframe your question in order to fit the material you found. And this is one of the key things that happens when you work with secondary or found material. As you are not raising the data yourself, sometimes you discover the really interesting questions in the middle of the research process. Now, it helps to start with a research question, but it also helps with secondary research to be flexible and reframe that question as you come across data that might be very interesting, uh, text and sources that you find really re revealing. Um, a really good book to take you through this process is Andrew Abbott's Digital Paper. Um, he really sees, uh, say, library-based research as an ongoing cycle and frankly, for most other research approaches, ultimately, we don't really run 
in a linear fashion through our research design, most of us cycle backwards and forwards and rephrase the question. And for secondary research, that is probably more necessary because you have less influence over the data you found. You're relying on what is already there. So what do you do then? You've rephrased your question. You have found the data that will allow you to answer this question. And you may now be thinking about what do I actually do? How do I analyze this material? So many of the resources on how to code data, that may be for interviews. You can apply just as well to texts. Um, another source that might be really helpful for you in understanding um, analysis may be Atkinson's and Coffey's piece in um, Silverman's Qualitative Research that focuses on analyzing documentary realities. And it really helps you take an analytical stance towards the documents that you're looking at. But one of the other approaches that very commonly works for almost any type of qualitative data would be um, an attempt to identify themes. So you can think about that as almost putting sticky notes on a printout, though you might do all of this digitally now. Um, and it really is about highlighting where are the important themes that speak to my research question? Do I find it across different types of documents? Do they agree or disagree? And one of the, the very easy um, articles to get you started are thinking about what you do with these themes and how do you go beyond to saying, oh, I found five themes in my data, is an article by Pat Baisley, analyzing qualitative data more than identifying themes, which really helps you in a very simple framework to think about comparing and contrasting the kind of themes you are finding in your textual data. And in many ways, these kind of approaches are similar to what you would be doing with primary data, but some of the other steps you've looked at previously around establishing cre credibility and validity, the way you triangulate between documents, is a little bit uh, perhaps specific to documentary research, but on the whole, identifying themes and coming up with um, strong elements to your analysis that help you answer your question, whatever that might be, is a good approach also for documentary research. So that's it for now on desk research. I hope this was helpful. I would uh, strongly advise you to also look at um, the sway I listed earlier around critically reviewing the literature, because remember, textual data is not the literature. The two should be completely separate as you work on your dissertation. And also another video on case study research, which is a very common approach that often uses this kind of, this kind of documentary research and helps you frame your research design quite effectively. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening and good luck for your dissertation.